LCT. This module is about program evaluations using the randomized control trial or RCT method. The RCT method is considered the best method for impact evaluation. As such, other methods are judged against the RCTs. If another evaluation method is able to reproduce the results of an RCT, then it can be considered a good method. The main characteristic of an RCT is the random allocation of economic units into treatment and control groups. This random assignment creates two statistically identical groups. They are identical in their observable characteristics and, more importantly, they are identical in their unobservable characteristics. To estimate the impact of a treatment, program or intervention, we can simply compare the performance indicators of a treatment group that benefited from an intervention with the performance of a control group that did not receive the treatment. In this module, we will discuss the very important issue of unobserved counterfactuals using what is called the potential outcome model. Despite their popularity, randomized control trials, or RCTs, are not a perfect solution to the problem of unobserved counterfactuals. We will discuss the issue of internal validity and external validity of an impact evaluation. These two concepts are useful for understanding RCTs as well as other non-experimental methods that will be presented in future modules. The simplest estimator that you can use in an RCT is the average treatment effect, or ATE. We will discuss the assumptions or conditions required to ensure its validity. At the end of the module, we will see some limitations of the randomized control trial method which partially justifies the use of other non-experimental methods. Even with unlimited resources, it is sometimes inappropriate or even impossible to use an RCT. An impact evaluation looks for causal links between a treatment and an outcome. For each economic agent or individual, we observe at least two things. First, an outcome, why? Why can be many things, school performance, public policies, anthropometric measures, etc. Second, we observe whether or not the economic agent was treated. Yt represents the outcome of an agent that received the treatment, and Yc is the outcome of an agent that did not. The set of untreated economic units is the control group, or C. The set of treated units is the treatment group, or T. To indicate the treatment status of a unit, I will use the binary variable T as in tau. Binary means that it can take two values, so t equals 1 if the unit receives treatment and t equals 0 if the unit does not receive the treatment. In this module, we will compare the effect of a treatment, such as a cash transfer, to the absence of treatment. The point of reference can also be an intervention. We could compare two treatments, their interaction and effect, to the absence of both. In 1974, a statistician, Donald Rubin, published an article in a psychology journal. He discussed how to statistically identify the causal effect of one variable on another, including matching and random assignment. An example of a causal relationship is the effect of reducing class size on the academic results of students. Rubin built a model based on the idea that each agent has two potential outcomes. In this example, for a student in a small class, we will observe the outcome y, t. The student is treated. If the student attends a normal size class, we will observe the outcome y, c. The student has not received the treatment. Both outcomes are possible for each individual. They are potential outcomes. The counterfactual is the outcome that an agent would have had if the opposite treatment status had been observed. For an individual in a small class, the counterfactual is the academic result we would have observed had the student attended a normal sized class. For an individual in the control group who does not receive the treatment, the counterfactual is the academic result in the case of a small class size. The treatment effect for an economic agent in this model is defined as the difference between the outcome that we observe and its counterfactual. For each agent, say for each individual, 1, 2, up to capital N, there are two potential outcomes, with and without the treatment. 
The theoretical definition of the causal effect is the difference between these two potential outcomes. Notice that there is a treatment effect for each one of the units. The average treatment effect, or ATE, is the average of these individual effects. While this may seem tautological, the concept goes further than it may first appear. There are at least two important points. First, there are other treatment effects. There is the Intention to Treatment Estimate, or ITT, the Local Average Treatment Effect, or LATE, the Effect of the Treatment on the Treated, or TOT, and so on. We will discuss some of these concepts later. Second, and more importantly, the average effect is a theoretical concept. The true mean effect cannot be calculated in an exact manner, it can only be approximated. It is impossible, of course, to observe the outcome of both the treatment and the control situations on the same economic agent simultaneously. We can observe one of the two potential outcomes, but not its counterfactual. This idea is called the fundamental problem of causal inference, the issue of unobserved counterfactuals. Donald Rubin, who we spoke of previously, is also renowned for studying the issue of missing data in statistics. You probably know that when survey data points are missing in a random manner, i.e. with no specific pattern, the estimators remain unbiased or, on average, can be considered good estimators. As such, a good way to estimate the average treatment effect, the ATE, is to randomly select which data points will be unobserved counterfactuals. That is to say, randomly selecting the outcomes that we can and cannot observe. Due to the unobserved counterfactuals problem, we cannot calculate the treatment effect for each individual. However, if unobserved outcomes are determined randomly, we can still get an unbiased estimator of the average treatment effect. The estimator is quite straightforward. It is the average outcome of units in the treated group minus the average outcome in the control group. The key for our estimator to have desirable statistical properties is the random selection of recipients and non-recipients. Since RCTs are based on the principle of purely random treatment assignment, they are considered, statistically speaking, to be the best evaluation method. Nonetheless, RCTs are not perfect. The problem remains that it is impossible to calculate the real average treatment effect even for a subgroup of a population. An RCT is the best way to estimate or provide the best approximation of the average treatment effect. One of the potential outcomes will be observed, for example, the agent receives the treatment, YT, but we do not observe the other potential outcome, YC, which would have occurred had the agent not received the treatment. This potential outcome that we do not observe is called the counterfactual. This issue of estimating counterfactuals is central to impact evaluation in general, not just RCTs. This means impact evaluation is all about estimating what would have happened had some units not been treated and vice versa. All impact evaluation methods are imperfect. Even with an RCT, we cannot observe the counterfactual. The best we can do is to approximate it. For estimating causal inference, RCTs have the best statistical properties. Let's return to complete our impact evaluation model. In practice, it cannot be guaranteed that all economic units will fully respect their assignment to the designated group, despite the best efforts of evaluators. To express this idea in our model, we define a new binary variable that is slightly different from our treatment variable. D, as in delta, is a variable representing the assignment to the treatment or the control group. D takes a value of 1 for any agent assigned to the treatment group and 0 if assigned to the control group. This new variable automatically creates four theoretical types of units. Compliance. Compliers are economic units that we all want to have in an RCT. They obey their assignment. For compliers, we will only observe YT if we assign them to treatment group D1. D1 
The vertical line here is not a division symbol. It is a conditional symbol. The way to read it is we observe the outcome of the treatment given that an agent was assigned to the treatment group. For compliers, I will observe the no treatment outcome YC when they are selected to be part of the control group D0. In other words, D is equal to T for compliers. The always takers. These are agents that find a way to benefit from the treatment regardless of their assignment. We always observe their treatment outcome YT even if they are placed in the control group D0. As the name suggests, the never takers never participate in the treatment, even if they are assigned to treatment group D1. These individuals always find a way to evade the treatment. The defiers are, we hope, an even rarer case. They never follow their random assignment. They always do the opposite to what we ask of them. We will observe the treatment outcome YT when defiers are selected to the control group. Conversely, we will observe the no treatment outcome YC when they are assigned to the treatment group D1. Note that even in the ideal situation of a complier type agent, the key issue of unobserved counterfactuals remains. All experimental and non-experimental impact evaluation methods seek to resolve the unobserved counterfactuals problem. I will now present the solution proposed by the random selection method, the RCT identification strategy. Suppose we want to calculate the treatment effect for an individual in treatment group D1. We have no problem observing the treatment outcome YT, however we cannot observe the counterfactual YC. We cannot observe what the outcome would have been had the agent not received the treatment. The RCT solution to this problem is fairly intuitive. Instead of an individual treatment effect, we will estimate the average effect across all units. Instead of the counterfactual, we use the expected outcome of a standard agent assigned to the control group D0. We expect that, on average, the outcome in D0 should be close to the value that we would have observed had the agent not received the treatment. Random selection is the best identification method that allows us to make this assumption. We can replace the counterfactual that we could not observe using the average of the control group. Let me digress for a moment to talk about the expected outcome, which is a concept in and of itself. I also want to briefly mention the empirical average, the sum divided by the number of observations. This empirical average is a completely different concept than the statistical expected value. However, in practice, when we do not know the expected value or the mean of a random variable, it is very common to use the empirical average as an approximation. Back to the main point. If the RCT is done well, in the sense of respecting the theoretical conditions of random assignment, you can be certain that you will benefit from all the statistical conditions required to approximate the unobserved counterfactual using the averages of the control group. We will now see which conditions allow us to confirm that an RCT is good, that it is well implemented and that we can count on its statistical properties to correctly estimate the expected impact of a treatment. Let's start by looking at the steps of an RCT. The first step is to define the population of interest. For example, I could be interested in potential beneficiaries of a social program. In this example, individuals with cars are likely to be financially better off and therefore not eligible for the treatment. As such, I am not interested in studying this group. Remember that the unit of study can be a person, a health centre, a school, or even a village or municipality. The population of eligible units includes all units for which you seek to determine the impact of a program. The second step of an RCT is to select a subgroup from this population for the impact evaluation. This is the experimental sample. If you are not performing an RCT, but rather using non-experimental methods, you should call it an evaluation sample. When this subgroup of the population of interest is selected randomly, i.e. by a systematic selection process that ensures statistical representativeness, 
our study gains what we call external validity. External validity is a very important concept that you should know and understand. External validity allows us to extrapolate our conclusions from our experimental sample to the population of interest. Unfortunately, random sampling is rarely possible in impact evaluations. In this case, we lose external validity of the study and can no longer extrapolate our conclusions across the population. However, our conclusions remain internally valid or valid within the evaluation sample or experimental sample. The key message here is that random sampling in the population of interest determines the external validity of a study. The third and most important step in an RCT is random assignment to treatment. This element will determine whether or not the study is a good RCT. For this, you need to be able to randomly assign units to a treatment group and a control group. There are many ways to do so. Chapter two of the evaluation using Stata document available on the course webpage shows you one method of random assignment also called random allocation or random selection. Random assignment into two groups is necessary, but not sufficient to ensure what we call internal validity. Internal validity refers to the comparability between the two groups, treatment and control. An RCT requires random assignment to the treatment and control groups. This statement does not mean that economic units necessarily have the same probability of being assigned to each group. All individuals should face the same probability, but the probability of being selected into the treatment group does not have to be exactly 50%. For some statistical properties, like power, 50% probability is better. But you could decide to give each unit a 30% probability of being assigned to the treatment group and a 70% probability of being assigned to the control group. For example, if the treatment is expensive, but following up with units in the control group is not expensive. You can increase the size of the control group relative to the treatment group without threatening the internal validity of your evaluation. Don't forget, random selection into the treatment and control groups provides our study with internal validity. Also note that the random sampling and the random assignment are two different concepts. It is a fairly common mistake to confuse random sampling with random assignment. You need to be able to recognize, differentiate and understand both concepts, not only for this module, but for the entire course. The main assumption of the random selection or RCT method is that selection is indeed random. Random assignment ensures statistical independence between potential outcomes and assignment to the treatment and control groups. This independence is the key assumption in RCTs. According to Rubin's model, there are two potential outcomes for each agent, Yt with treatment and Yc without treatment. The geometric expression of independence is orthogonality. This is the reason why its symbol has a 90 degree angle. Orthogonality of outcomes with respect to D means that potential outcomes are independent of the assignment into treatment and control groups. There is a sort of magic in random assignment because it tells us about the statistical properties of characteristics that we cannot observe or which are difficult to measure. Random allocation equalizes the expected distributions of characteristics between treatment and control groups. If the sample size is large enough, the observed averages of the two groups should be very close. With good random allocation, you will observe that most of the average characteristics of the control and treatment groups are statistically identical. Average age, average income, average education level, the proportion of men to women, etc. And better still, you know, even if you cannot observe it, that theoretically the expected values in the two groups are identical. So for all the factors that you can't observe or which are difficult to measure, average motivation, average intelligence, corruption levels, aversion to risk, beauty, all the statistical averages are theoretically identical in both groups. You can only get this with RCTs. Other evaluation methods, such as matching, 
can balance the observable characteristics for each group, but never the unobservable variables. The RCT estimator of the average treatment effect, ATE, is the simplest estimator of the effect of treatment. It is calculated by subtracting the average outcome in the control group from the average outcome in the treatment group. The ATE is a good estimator if units who received the treatment were selected, and here comes that word again, randomly. It is randomization that makes both groups comparable in an RCT. The psychologist Donald T. Campbell proposed a sort of taxonomy of validity, which is relevant for impact evaluations. He presented many types of validity and explained the conditions under which we lose each validity. His article explains the conclusions that we have the right or not to draw from our evaluation. For us, the most important is internal validity, which we achieve with random assignment to the treatment and control groups. Internal validity enables us to interpret our estimator of the treatment effect as a causal effect. When there is internal validity, we can conclude that observed differences between the treatment and control groups come directly from the treatment and not from other factors. All impact evaluation methods, including RCTs, aim to ensure internal validity through a variety of techniques. RCTs use random assignment. However, it is very important to remember that constructing the groups randomly does not automatically ensure internal validity. You can lose the internal validity of an RCT in many ways. For example, contamination. Suppose that we have perfectly randomly selected the recipients of a cash transfer or monetary aid in a village. Now suppose that an individual in the treatment group is the brother-in-law of an individual in the control group. The treated individual takes his money, opens up a motorcycle repair shop and employs his brother-in-law from the control group. You return six months later and compare the outcomes. You compare the income of the treatment and the control group and find out that the difference between the two is not significant. Concluding that the cash transfer had no effect is a mistake because the units in the control group also benefited from the treatment. They were contaminated. One potential solution to avoid contamination is to choose individuals who are geographically and socially distant. Potential contamination problems must always be accounted for when doing an RCT. Another way to lose internal validity is non-random attrition. Non-random attrition creates a section bias. This occurs when individuals end their link to a study in a non-random manner. In the example of the cash transfer, treated individuals can decide to use the money from the treatment to move to the city. You return six months later and compare the outcomes of the control group and those who remain in the village from the treatment group. We have lost the treatment effect for those who left the village. Perhaps the migrants would have increased the average of the treatment group and you would have found a larger treatment effect. When you conduct an RCT, you could unintentionally generate evaluation effects. Evaluation effects refer to a set of changes in behaviour due to the evaluation itself and not only to the treatment. Evaluation effects can jeopardise the internal validity of your study. Among the evaluation effects, there are Hawthorne effects, John Henry effects, Ashenfelter's dip, and many others. In the course readings, you will find the definition of these concepts. When you do an RCT, you must always consider the possibility of evaluation effects and find a way to minimise the chance of them occurring. An example of the John Henry effect. Suppose that units in the control group feel insulted because they were not selected to receive the cash transfer. Why does only some of the village get free money? One potential reaction is that the units in the control group decide to show the evaluators that they can succeed without help. They take out bank loans, open repair shops, convenience stores, apply themselves and work hard. You come back six months later to compare the incomes of the two groups and conclude that there was no difference between the treatment and the control and that the treatment had no effect. This conclusion is incorrect. Units in the control group modified their behaviour due to the evaluation. 
even if they did not receive a direct cash transfer. Your counterfactual is no longer valid. To summarise, when you plan an impact evaluation, in particular an RCT, you need to think about potential situations that may undermine the internal validity of your study, and then take the necessary measures to avoid them. RCTs are the gold standard used to judge all other impact evaluation methods, but this does not mean that RCTs are perfect. They are an imperfect solution to the problem of unobserved counterfactuals. By using RCTs, we reduce the assumptions needed to get a good estimate of the treatment impact of a program. The main assumption of RCTs is that potential outcomes are independent of random assignment. The average treatment effect, ATE, is a simple estimator of the treatment impact. It is the difference of average outcomes between the treatment and control units. In the next module, we will discuss two excellent statistical properties of the ATE for RCTs. They are unbiased and convergent. The limitations or disadvantages to RCTs. Collecting data is costly. In most cases, you have to collect your own data. You cannot simply use secondary data from previous surveys. It is often difficult to obtain permission to conduct random selection. A useful argument when you try to convince policymakers is that random selection is a fair method. It gives the same chance of participating to everyone without preference or privilege. Sometimes randomization is unethical or simply not possible. For example, if you are studying the consequences of tobacco consumption among youth, it is unethical to ask a group of youth selected at random to smoke for six months for your study. If you study the effect of mining exploitation on labour market participation, it is simply not possible to create mines in randomly selected regions in order to study their effects. Given these difficulties in conducting RCTs, economists use a variety of econometric tools to conduct rigorous impact evaluations and estimate causal effects of programs and interventions. Mm -hmm.